Hello everyone, welcome back to our last and final topic of the semester. So we are going to finish off the semester with topic 21 and topic 21 is all about DNA mutations and we're going to do a muscular dystrophy case study. So this topic is broken up into three parts. First, we're going to start with a general introduction to mutations, and then we're going to do some practice with mutations. So practicing, figuring out if I give you a practice problem, what kind of mutation is it? And then in video number two, that is where we're going to do our muscular dystrophy case study. So our overarching question for this topic is, what effects can modifications in DNA have on the processes of replication, transcription, and translation? And our second question is, what greater organismal effects might this potentially lead to? So, of course, when people think about mutations, they think of mutants. And so, what better way to think about mutants than this one-eyed frog over here, or of course, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, or X-Men. And so, I will tell you, um, my husband actually forced me to watch X-Men before I made this presentation and before I put together this lecture topic. And he said that I cannot reference um, mutants if I've never actually seen the movie. And I will say I was very pleasantly surprised. I'm normally not the type of person that likes superhero movies. They're just not my cup of tea. But I will say that this was a fabulous movie, so much so that I actually told them that I wanted to see the other X-Men movies. So that is on our list of things to do during this quarantine time um, after the semester ends is to watch a couple more of those. But anyways, I digress. So even though society has all these different views of mutants and mutations, um, let's first think about, well, how often do mutations occur? So I want you all to go ahead and in the comments below, let me know how often do you think that mutations happen? And it turns out that it depends, right? <laughs> first, that's that's the easiest answer to turn to as well, it depends. But um, it turns out that for things like our DNA polymerases, that it depends on whether it is a bacteria, whether it's a eukaryote or a virus. Viruses tend to have polymerases that aren't as great, and so their polymerases are a little bit more error prone than bacteria or eukaryotes. Um, bacteria's DNA polymerases are definitely more error prone than eukaryotes as well. So if we were to make like a general average statement in terms of the enzymes themselves, so for DNA polymerase, the mutation rate is about one in a hundred thousand base pairs, which doesn't seem too bad, but if you think about our genome being three billion or so base pairs long, that's a lot of mutations there. But of hers, we have repair mechanisms, right? So mutations can happen due to exogenous factors like being exposed to too much sunlight, right? Um, getting a sunburn or it can happen because enzymes ha have an intrinsic mutation rate, right? When you're texting someone, autocorrect gets you every time, right? So um, we do have repair mechanisms and it turns out with all the DNA repair mechanisms that we have in place, this kind of takes down the mutation rate to about one mistake per 10 to the negative eighth to 10 to the negative ninth nucleotides. So this ends up being our overall mutation rate. And this is in bacteria, but we think it's pretty close in humans. So 10 to the negative ninth is one mistake per 1 billion, and then 10 to the negative eighth is 100 million. So much better than that one in 100,000 base pairs. And there's a couple of other things that we have to think about when it comes to this idea of mutations. So when we think of this one mistake per billion base pairs, you know, we probably think, oh my gosh, that's bad. That's horrible. What's going to happen? Well, it turns out that not all mutations are bad right? In some cases, evolutionarily speaking, they can definitely be advantageous. And in some cases, we don't even see a difference. And so something to keep in mind at the back of your head as we go through this is this idea that not all 
genotypic mutations lead to phenotypic changes. So we love to, in genetics, kind of talk about this idea of linking genotype and phenotype together, but just because there is a mutation doesn't mean it's bad, and it does not mean that at that genotypic level that, that will lead to a phenotypic change. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the four types of mutations that we have. So we're going to start with a blank page. And we're going to build a table here. So we're going to have the kind or the type, and then we'll have the definition of that mutation, and then we'll do an example. So if you have not yet pulled out your codon table, I encourage you to go ahead and grab that because we will certainly need it for this. So the first type of mutation that we can have is a silent mutation. And for a silent mutation, this is going to have no effect. So for example, if we have at the DNA level TCT and DNA polymerase makes a mistake, our repair mechanisms don't catch it, so this is our DNA, now we have TCC. So when that goes through the process of transcription, we will have UCU. And now, because we made a mistake during replication somewhere, now we have UCC. Well, if you take a look at that, at those codons, using your codon table, you will see that UCU codes for serine and UCC also codes for serine. So when we say that this is a silent mutation and that it has no effect is because even though at the DNA and RNA level there is a difference in those bases, at the protein level there is no effect whatsoever. So the second type of mutation that we can have is a missense mutation. And a missense mutation changes an amino acid. So let's use our same example of starting with TCT. And now what if we have TAT instead? So let's go ahead and transcribe that. So we will have UCU. And now we have UAU. And so we started with the serine. And now if you look up UAU using our codon table, that changes the amino acid to TYR or tyrosine. So a missense mutation is going to cause the changing of one amino acid. The third type of mutation that we have is something called a nonsense mutation. And this changes an amino acid but the change is very specific. It changes an amino acid to a stop codon. So using our same example of TCT, now let's change that to TAA. If we transcribe that at the RNA level, we go from UCU to UAA, and now we go from a serine to a stop. And this can lead to a premature stop, which means that the protein may not be as long as it should be. And then last but not least, the fourth type of mutation that we have is a frame shift mutation. And for a frame shift mutation, this is an insertion or a deletion of one or more base pairs. And depending on how many base pairs are inserted or deleted, you can imagine that this can change the reading frame. And you'll recall from video one that this is really important. So the reading frame is a really big deal when it comes to translation. Let's go ahead and do an example of a frame shift mutation. So we are going to start with TCT ATG, so that's going to be our DNA, and we're going to do, let's do an insertion. So what if we have TTC, TATG, so we've added 
here an extra T. So this is an insertion type of frame shift. And let's go and write our RNA. So we had UCUAUG, which is a serine, and this is a methionine. And then now we have UUCUAUG in the RNA, but here is now a phenylalanine and a tyrosine. So we can see because of this frame shift, it changed the reading frame and now we have a different protein. So now let's go ahead and using our new knowledge of mutations, let's do some practice and let's talk about some application of this. So the first example that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about antibiotic resistance. So this is a hot topic in many fields right now. And right now, of course, people are saying we're entering the post-antibiotic era with the amount of antibiotic resistance that we have. But what we're going to do is we're going to talk about RNA polymerase. So part of RNA polymerase, and this is going to be specifically about bacterial RNA polymerases, is RPOB. And RPOB, like I said, this is just part of the RNA polymerase. And that protein is shown here on the right. And it turns out that we have many antibiotics that target the RNA polymerase. And of course, the target here is bacterial RNA polymerase. There's enough differences between bacterial and us that this works. And there's a couple of different antibiotics that you've probably heard of. So there's rifampin, um, neomycin, and neomycin is the antibiotic that's found in neosporin. There's different tetracyclines. So for example, doxycycline is one that is particularly used for Lyme disease. But anyways, the point is that we have a lot of these antibiotics that target RNA polymerase, and part of their target is RPOB. Well, it turns out because of the selection pressure, we can actually get antibiotic resistance that occurs because of a mutation. So, for example, if we have a bunch of bacteria, so here is a population of bacteria, and let's go ahead and draw a pink one. This pink one has a mutation in RPOB. And this happened by chance. So this happened to be one of those 1 times 10 to the negative eighth mutations that happened to stick. And um, so here we have this population of bacteria. And it happens to be that the pink one has a mutation in RPOB that confers resistance to the antibiotic. Now, and without the presence of antibiotic, this doesn't matter, right? This population of bacteria will continue to grow. But now, if we put in an antibiotic, now we have selection pressure, and all of these are going to die. And what we will end up with is a bunch of bacteria that now have resistance to the antibiotic. And I drew a different colored one in there for good measure because we know that mutations are going to continue to arise. And so now this green one has a mutation potentially somewhere else. And so this is just something that happens. Well, it turns out that we can go and we can map those mutations and we can figure out how do bacteria get resistance to these antibiotics. And scientists have done this for RPOB. And what they have found is the gray protein here is the wild type protein and the yellow is a mutant protein. So hopefully you can see this yellow one here. The structure is similar to the gray one, but you can see that some of these don't quite match up. And it turns out that one example of this is a one amino acid change and the RNA polymerase still works. It can still do transcription just fine, but the antibiotics can no longer 
affect the RNA polymerase, and this is how bacteria are one of the ways that they can become resistant. So with that one amino acid change, we can actually figure out, based on our newfound knowledge, that this would be a missense mutation. Because recall, missense mutations result in the change of one amino acid. So let's talk about another example. So this will be a throwback to the beginning of the semester. So hopefully you all remember our protein modeling activity that we did at the beginning of the semester. We talked about sickle cell anemia and we talked about specifically hemoglobin. So here is the structure of hemoglobin. And we said that in sickle cell anemia, we have the change of a glutamic acid to a valine. So again, we have the change of one amino acid, and so that's going to be a missense mutation. But let's go ahead and take a closer look at why this matters and why this is important. So that one change in that one amino acid causes hemoglobin to actually have a change in its shape, and this leads to the change in the blood cell shape. So here is what a typical red blood cell looks like, so this really pretty donut shape. On the right here, we have um, red blood cells that have a sickle cell hemoglobin, so you can see that they're misshaped and misformed, and the reason for this is that hemoglobin kind of globs up together and you don't get that pretty protein structure that you're supposed to. And because of the shape of these red blood cells, instead of having the red blood cells flow through the blood vessels naturally, when we have curves like this, because of the shape, they can get stuck. And that can lead to blockage of blood flow, which leads to a lot of the symptoms that we see in patients that have sickle cell anemia. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk and look at what happened to the DNA, the RNA, and the protein. So we're going to draw out the partial DNA sequence here. So we're going to do the normal and then the mutation just to leave myself enough room here. Move the DNA here. All right, so we have C, C, T, G, A, G, G, A, G as our normal sequence for hemoglobin. And then we can complement that. So GGA, CTC, CTC. For the mutation, we have CCT, G, T, G, G, A, G. And again, we can complement this. So GGA. Okay, so this is our DNA. Let's go ahead and draw out now our RNA sequence. So for our RNA sequence, we have CCU, GAG, GAG. And actually, because I have given you the RNA sequence, we automatically know that this is the five prime end and this is the three prime end. And we can figure out what the coding and the template strand is. So if this is our RNA, we know that the coding strand looks like the RNA, except that it has U's instead of T's. So that makes this top strand coding and this bottom DNA strand the template strand. So we can also add on our five primes and our three primes as well. So again, really powerful if you know the terminology, the things that you can do. So let's go ahead and write out our RNA for our strand that has a mutation. So we will have CCU, G, U, G, and then G, A, G. And if you pull out your codon chart, you will see that this encodes for a proline, a glutamic acid, and a glutamic acid. And whereas for our mutation, the first amino acid is fine, so we get a proline, but GUG, instead of a glutamine, we get a valine, and then GAG is the same, so we have GLU. So there is one amino acid difference, and so this is a missense mutation. 
And when we think about what that looks like at the protein level, instead of getting this pretty protein that has the four polypeptides, so this one has a quaternary structure that assembles into hemoglobin, it's also shown right here with the four domains, you get hemoglobin that clusters together. So when you get the clustering of the hemoglobin, this is what leads to the red blood cells having the weird shapes, whereas a normal red blood cell has that typical donut shape. So I just kind of wanted to show you at the molecular level what's going on. And the sequences that are here are not made up. These are the sequences that are found in normal hemoglobin and then one of the mutations associated with um, or the mutation associated with sickle cell anemia. So let's do a couple more examples. So here we have the original DNA sequence on the top, and then we have a mutation on the bottom. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what kind of mutation is this. So we have our DNA, and let's go ahead and we know for RNA it looks like DNA, but it has a U instead. So let's go ahead and write that out. So again, just writing out our RNA. And the way that I'm doing that is just taking the DNA and replacing the T's with U's. And now we can go ahead and use our codon chart and we can figure out what the proteins are going to be. So go ahead and do that while I'm working on it as well. So hopefully you have come up with isoleucine, valine, arginine, arginine, and tyrosine. And now let's repeat the same process for our bottom strand here, for our mutant strand. And I went ahead and I highlighted the parts that are different here. So let's start translating this. So we have ILE, so isoleucine, valine, arginine, arginine, and tyrosine. If we look at our original DNA sequence and our new DNA sequence in the RNA and then the proteins, we see that there is no change. Therefore, this is a silent mutation. All right, let's do one more example. So again, same concept. We've got our original DNA sequence and our mutation, and I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm going to write out my RNA first, and then I'm going to go ahead and translate that. And then let's move on to the bottom strand, and I'm going to highlight the differences here. So it turns out here we have two differences, but let's translate this to see if this will make any difference in the protein. So if we look at our two mutations, this one right here, so mutation number one, changing a T to a C, this is a silent mutation. So with the original DNA sequence, we had ASB, and now we also have ASB, so no changes there. But we have a change with number with mutation number two. So we had a T, now we have an A, and now we have a stop codon. And so this mutation is a nonsense mutation. All right, so now what we have to think about is, okay, we've got these different mutations, and this is the same mutation for the previous problem that we just talked about. What I want you all to do is to think about, well, what effects do you think these mutations are going to have on the different processes? So when we think about DNA replication, for the original DNA sequence versus the mutation, is that going to have any effects? Nope, right? So a mutation doesn't have any effects on DNA replication. DNA replication will continue as normal. Now what about transcription? Are there going to be any effects for transcription? Not really, right? RNA polymerase doesn't care that there's a mutation there. Um, now, you could make the argument if the mutation was found in the promoter, that special sequence, and it messed up the promoter somehow, potentially, but as a whole, I didn't tell you where the mutation is, so you can assume it's not in the promoter. Um, so, in general, nope. RNA polymerase is going to just use the DNA as a template and using base pairing and complementation, it's going to figure out what RNA to make. Now, what about translation? 
Absolutely, right? So mutations are going to affect translation. They could affect the start, the stop, if, an, if a stop is inserted too soon. They're going to affect what tRNA comes in, so what anticodon is able to base pair with the codon. So the key here is that these mutations are going to affect translation. The polymerases don't really care about mutations. And this will become more evident as we work on our case study. So for our case study, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about two siblings. And these siblings live with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And Liam is affected, whereas Elijah is unaffected. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use information that is provided and then our knowledge of DNA replication and the central dogma and mutations to explore what nucleotide changes resulted in Liam developing muscular dystrophy, but not Elijah. So this is the end of day one of mutations. For day two, we're going to focus entirely on the case study. So thanks everyone, and I'll catch you on the flip side.